Most analysts say that even in a volatile market, you should still invest for the long term. Randy Alcorn reminds us that concept is true for the very long term as well. Every time we give of ourselves to other people in the name of Christ and for the glory of God, we are investing treasure in heaven. This is the Revive Our Hearts podcast with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth, author of Surrender, The Heart God Controls. It's Tuesday, November 30th, 2021, and today is Giving Tuesday. I'm Dana Gresh. Over the past year or so, during the course of the pandemic, thousands of people have felt the sting of losing a job. Today's guest knows what that's like. A number of years ago, he voluntarily gave up his salary and chose to make minimum wage. We'll hear that story and find out what he learned about long-term investment. It's a continuation of the conversation we began yesterday, and I want to remind you it's available on the Revive Our Hearts app or at reviveourhearts.com if you missed yesterday. Here's Nancy with Randy Alcorn. We're talking this week about one of my very favorite subjects and one that Jesus talked about a lot. In fact, he talked about this subject more than he talked about heaven and hell combined. So it should be important to us as well. It's the subject of giving. And our guest this week is author and speaker Randy Alcorn, who's written a wonderful little book called The Treasure Principle, Discovering the Secret of Joyful Giving. Randy, welcome back to Revive Our Hearts. Thanks, Nancy. It's great to be with you. And thank you for writing about this subject without apology and for calling us to evaluate what really matters to us, what we love, what we treasure, where our hearts are. I find that I consistently need checkups in this area of my life because my heart is so prone to go toward the things that are temporal and seen and visible and to start to put down roots here on this earth. But you challenge us in this book to remember that our home isn't here on earth. That's right. Our home is in heaven, and that's really the, the third key to the treasure principle. Heaven, not earth, is my home. The treasure principle itself is we can't take it with us, but we can send it on ahead. And Jesus told us that in, in Matthew 6, that we could actually lay up treasures in heaven. And, and we do that. We lay up treasures in heaven not only by giving and that's certainly the primary way that he was speaking of. But we give in other ways. We give of our time. Uh, we give uh, of our talents, our giftings. We invest ourselves uh, in our children, in our aging parents, in our friends who have needs, who someone's gone through a divorce or someone has been abandoned, someone is uh, struggling with cancer. And Every time we give of ourselves to other people in the name of Christ and for the glory of God, we are investing treasure in heaven. And yet that's not natural for us to do. Our natural bent is to lay up treasures here on earth, to go for the things that we can see. I mean, think about what comprises just an average day for those of us who are average people. We're having to deal with jobs and expenses and bills and shopping and um, many of our listeners as wives and moms getting their homes cared for and their children clothed and fed. And it's not that these things don't have any value, but it's so easy to start to focus on those things as if that's all there were. That's right. And we begin to live under the illusion that this earth is our home when in fact scripture tells us specifically our home is in another place. The carpenter from Nazareth says, I go to prepare a place for you and that where I am, you may be also. I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. I'm going to take you to that place. Whether by his second coming or by our death, we will come into the presence of God and we will spend eternity in heaven. And that's hard for us to grasp onto because our true home is a place we have never been, which is a paradox. Mm. But it really is the way that we need to think and live uh, to live in light of eternity. In Colossians 3, we're told, set your minds above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. In other words, set your mind on heaven. 
And there's that old saying, uh, this person is uh, so heavenly minded, he's of no earthly good. Well, that is so far from the truth. Mm. Uh, the truth is we're so earthly minded, we're of no heavenly good. Yeah. And sometimes we're so earthly minded, we're of no earthly good. And the person who is truly heavenly minded is ultimately of the greatest earthly good. The Bible says we're pilgrims, we're strangers, we're aliens. It says that in Hebrews 11. We're ambassadors representing our true king and our true country. Our citizenship is in heaven, Philippians 3.20 says. We're citizens of a better country, a heavenly one. Scripture goes on and on and, and makes these references just to remind us of who we really are and whose we really are, mm. and therefore what kingdom we should be living in light of. And you give a great illustration of that. If you were living in one country, but your home was really in another country... Yes. Suppose your home was in France and you're living in America for three months, you're living in a hotel, and you're told, here's the ground rules. You can't bring anything back to France on your flight home, but you can earn money and you can mail deposits to your bank in France. So would you fill your hotel room with expensive furniture and wall hangings? Well, no. You'd send your money where your home is. You'd only spend what you needed on the temporary residence. You know, maybe you'd have a few aesthetic things to help you in that 90 days that you're there, but you're certainly not going to fill the room with all these expensive items because you can't take it with you. But since you can send the money, what you've earned, on ahead so it'll be waiting for you when you get back home, that's what you do. You send it back to your true country. Then when you arrive back in your true country, there it is waiting for you. And that's very much what Jesus is saying. You can't take it with you, but you can send it on ahead to your true home where you're going to be spending an eternity. Second Peter 3 says the earth and everything in it will be burned by fire. It's not going to last. But... We can invest in eternity in a place where these things will last forever. And yet most of us are like that person living in one country and and acting as if we were going to be there forever, spending our time, our resources, our efforts, our focus on something that is, well, you said 90 days. We may not have that many days That's right. Uh, in this home. It's not our home. I remember, Randy, I, I traveled, as many of our listeners have heard, uh, lived on the road serving the Lord in ministry for many years throughout my 20s and into my mid-30s and didn't have a home uh, that was a permanent place. And there were days when that was hard and was challenging, but the Lord used to continually remind me, this earth isn't your home. You're moving toward a permanent home. Then in my mid-30s, the Lord gave me the blessing and the privilege of having a home. And I remember as I was praying through that decision, uh, and I did sense the Lord was leading in that way and giving me the freedom to take that step. It was a different season of ministry at that time. I wasn't going to be traveling as much. But I remember having this little bit of reluctance because God had given me such a sense of freedom about not owning things, about being detached from the pressures and responsibilities and focus of home ownership. And I remember saying to the Lord, if it's your will for me to have an earthly house, a home, first of all, I want to make sure to always remember it's not mine. It's yours, and it's to be used for your glory and your kingdom and your purposes. But I also asked the Lord, would you protect my heart? Would you help me to keep a pilgrim mindset and not to put down roots in this earth system. Now, my heart was sincere. I meant that with all my heart. But I have to tell you that since getting a home, it's been a lot harder. And I have to work at it constantly to make sure that my heart doesn't get attached to things down here on earth. Exactly. Think of those words in John 14. It is the greatest love story ever it, it is like the prototype romance, and it's true romance. It's the carpenter from Nazareth who has gone to his bride, his bride who he is about to die for, mm. and he says, I'm going to go build this place for you, and I'm going to come back to take you to live with me there forever. And so think how often would this bride anticipate her beloved bridegroom and being with him in this home that he is making for her to live with him forever. You know, would would weeks at a time go by where she doesn't think hmm. of uh, him and her home in heaven? No, of course not. Would days go by where she doesn't? No, probably not an hour would go by. Not very many minutes would go by without her thinking of her beloved 
her bridegroom, uh, and she's going to be at this wedding feast with him, and he has prepared a place for her. And all of a sudden, everything else pales in comparison Mm -hmm. when we think in those terms. And the importance of accumulating more and more and more things here Uh, suddenly we realize that that's not what it's about. Mm. If we have an opportunity to, so to speak, send building materials on ahead Mm. through the treasures in heaven that are going up to our Lord, more stuff that he can use in the building project. And think of what heaven is going to be like. I mean, I talk about heaven in all of my books, fiction and nonfiction, because I love to think about heaven and what scripture says about heaven, but consider that Jesus is a carpenter by trade, and he also has some attributes that come in very handy in a building project, Uh, omniscience, omnipotence, (laughs) you know, and he's had a couple of thousand years to prepare this place for us. Now, now, is this going to be a great place? I mean, this is going to be a great place beyond our wildest dreams, and our wildest dreams, you know, are pretty substantial. And what a thing to look forward to. But when you think in those terms, the way that we think determines the way that we live. And so if we just do what Colossians 3 says, to set our minds above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, to think more about heaven and our home in heaven, it will affect the way we live on earth. And I have found in my own life that my natural instinct is to keep getting drawn down earthward, to focus more on earthly things. I mean, those things just They creep in. Jesus said that cares and riches and pleasures of this life are like thorns that grow up and they choke out the seed of the word in our lives and they cause us to become unfruitful. And I found that giving joyously, generously, regularly, wholeheartedly, that giving is the greatest antidote to materialism. If I want to keep my heart focused on heaven and I want to keep my my stock there, I want to keep my relationship with Jesus Christ as the primary focus of my life, that giving is what helps me do that. As I'm parting with my earthly treasures, as I become more detached from things of this earth, what happens is that then my heart becomes more attached to the things of heaven and the things of eternity. That's exactly right. And I think if we experience God's grace, we become givers because God is the ultimate giver. And if we give, we experience God's grace because, again, we're doing a Christ-like thing. So giving flows out of a knowledge of God and flows right back into Mm -hmm. a knowledge Mm -hmm. and experience of God. And giving flies in the face of my natural bent, which is to hold on to things of this earth. I don't like to think of myself as a greedy person or a covetous person, and probably most people who know me would not say she's a greedy person or a covetous person. But I'll just be honest and say covetousness in the New Testament means just the desire for more. If you define it that way, I have to say I have naturally a covetous heart. It's so easy to become discontent, dissatisfied with what I have. You know, I've said before that I think the wardrobe I have is fine till I start leafing through catalogs or I start walking right. through a mall and yes. see all the things I don't have, all the newest styles and fashions, and, and then we start comparing with what others have. Those seeds, those roots of discontentment start so subtly to take root in our hearts, and before we know it, we don't have the love for Jesus, the tender heart toward him, the love for eternal, the spiritual matters. We're tied up and tied down with things of this earth, and I find that what flies in the face of that, what helps me to deal with it, is this whole matter of giving. Scripture says covetousness is idolatry, and things have mass, and mass has gravity, and gravity holds us in orbit around it. So we tend to accumulate more and more things, and then we start revolving around those things. So giving is, in essence, a Copernican revolution of the Christian life. Mm because Copernicus realized that the sun does not revolve around the earth, the earth revolves around the sun. Mm. We need to realize uh, God and the spiritual world and everything else does not revolve around us. We revolve around God. And by giving 
to God, we are laying up treasures in heaven and we're shifting the center of gravity from earth to heaven so that we're held in orbit around the things of heaven. Now, in our own particular lives, my wife and I and our daughters uh, experienced back in, in 1990 – uh, kind of a, uh, a wake-up call to where our citizenship really is because uh, I'd been a pastor for a number of years. If you would have asked me, what are you going to be doing uh, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, I, I would have said, well, I assume I'll still be a pastor of Good Shepherd Community Church. I loved what I was doing. I was doing a little bit of writing, a little bit of speaking on the side, but by far my primary job was was being a local church pastor, and I loved it. But because we had had a heart uh, for uh, children uh, dying from abortion and for uh, women being exploited by abortion, uh, over a number of years, we'd opened up our home to a young woman who lived with us. She was pregnant. She, we helped her give up her child for adoption to a Christian home. Uh, she came to Christ while she was living with us. I was on the board of the First Crisis Pregnancy Center out in the Portland, Oregon area. And uh, then God laid it on our hearts uh, to be involved in uh, rescuing and civil disobedience for the unborn in the late 80s and uh, the first part of 1990, a number of times uh, went out to clinics completely uh, peacefully, nonviolently, uh, just offering women alternatives, uh, giving them literature and standing in front of the doors of the clinic and trying to do what we thought was right in light of what uh, Proverbs says, speak up for those who can not speak for themselves. Well, as a result of this, to say the least, this was not a popular behavior, and uh, we had lawsuits brought against us, and suddenly I had to resign as a pastor from my church because they were coming to the church uh, to uh, garnish my wages because I said to a judge that uh, I, will, I will pay people anything that I owe them, but I will not write out a check to an abortion clinic because they will use it to kill children, and that's a violation of conscience, and obviously, you know, it's the wrong thing to do. So they came to the church to to uh, take it out of my wages. So suddenly, uh, we were no longer doing what we had been doing. I could not make more than minimum wage because an abortion clinic will garnish anything more than minimum wage to take to uh, pay off these uh, huge uh, judgments that were brought against this one judgment for eight point four million dollars, mm, mm. which is more than I made as a pastor in a year. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, the point was that all of a sudden I could not legally own anything. Now, in fact, I have access to all the. Uh, things that uh, that my wife owns. My wife own, by the way, reminds me that you, you better be nice to me since <laughs> I own everything and you own absolutely nothing. Uh. <laughs> Hopefully I'd be nice to her anyway. She's wonderful. She's the light of my life besides the Lord. She's the one that I'm by far closest mm-hmm. to. Uh, but anyway, uh, as you can imagine, it was a trial. It was difficult for the family. But boy, what we learned about God's ownership and God's provision over the years is just mm-hmm. something we would not if we could turn back the clock and make that to have never happened we wouldn't do it mm. they intended it for evil but as joseph said of his brother's betrayal god intended it for good so did this result in some practical lifestyle changes for your family well for in a way it did but fortunately by god's grace we had already learned to live on much less than what our income was. Well, can you say that again? That, that's almost unthinkable in this culture. Well, we had learned some things about giving. I had written a book called Money, Possessions, and Eternity and had really studied through what Scripture says in this area. And we were really trying to put it into practice. And so we realized that I was paid generously uh, as a pastor. I had a little bit of side income from book royalties and speaking and that sort of thing. And it was just way more than we needed. So we were giving away a, a significant portion. Uh, of what God had provided for us. And we were experiencing the joy of giving. And we also had paid off our house early. So we had a 30-year mortgage, but we paid it off in 15 years. And we actually made our last house payment two months before this whole thing happened uh, where I suddenly could only make minimum wage. So with house paid off, no house payment, uh, with 
uh, numbers of other uh, ways that God provided for us, we did fine. But yeah, it was certainly a change. I mean, we realized that we might have to take our girls out of the Christian school that they were going to because that's a significant amount. The tuition God provided in amazing ways so that they didn't have to be taken out of school. And that wouldn't have been a tragedy. We could have, you know, lived with that and we could have gone with the alternatives, but God in his grace allowed us to still experience those things. But we learned so much about trusting in God for his provision mm. simply because our income was dramatically reduced. And a lot of people live under the myth that somehow income is always going to go up the rest of their lives. And mm. there are many women out there who have experienced themselves in their own job situations and their husband's job situations, cutbacks, where uh, they are – having to live now on significantly less than they did at one time in their lives. And it's easy to feel, and I think many would think, that with my limited income or my reduced income, there's no way I can really be a giver. It's interesting because in Philippians 4, in the context of giving, he's talked several times about giving in Philippians, and he's going to end up the chapter talking about it. He says, I'm not saying this because I'm in need. I have learned to be content. And that's interesting. I've learned Mm -hmm. to be content. Mm -hmm. That means it didn't come naturally. Mm -hmm. You know, otherwise there's no learning curve needed. I have learned to be content, Paul says, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need. I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. He gives Christ Hmm. the full credit for that. And then he ends up the chapter by saying, I'm not looking for a gift. He's thanking them for the financial support they've given him, but I am looking for what may be credited to your account. And these are all financial terms. And what he's saying is, God's going to take care of me one way or the other, whether you send me a gift or not. But when you send a gift to invest in my life and my ministry, I want you to know that God has an account in heaven that he has opened, and it is a deposit into that account when you give to God's kingdom work. And that, to me, is is a great concept. That is exactly what Jesus was talking about, laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven to the glory of God. So you faced that time of your lives when your income was significantly reduced and you found yourself living on minimum wage. What happened from there? Because I legally couldn't own anything, uh, we had transferred the royalties from all of my books to the ministry uh, so that that way they couldn't be attached uh, by uh, the abortion clinics. And what we decided to do when the royalties came to the ministry is not to keep them, but to give away the great majority of them, a minimum of 90%. And for the last three or four years, we've given away 100% of the book royalties. And the reason we wanted to do that, because we just felt this is the way that God is providing, uh, not simply for us, we don't need this, but... Uh, we have the opportunity to invest in missions work and pro-life work and prison work and family ministries and all these different things. So what happened was as a result of that, we thought that in another 10 years, um, which actually ended in uh, 2001, we thought that we would be able to Uh, have those royalties come back to us again. And the ministry uh, said to us when the time was coming, the board said, uh, it's time for you to go ahead and take those royalties back. Well, Nancy and I sat down. We talked about it. We prayed about it. We said, no, wait a minute. Why would we take those? Because they're being given away to God's kingdom. We don't need them. God has provided for us for 10 years. We do fine on my minimum wage plus what the ministry is able to provide uh, beyond that. So... Let's not take them. And we made that decision, brought it back to the board, and they said, well, okay, we'll just continue that way and we'll continue giving away uh, the royalties. And then two or three months after we made that decision, we received the information that the abortion clinic had managed to get another 10 years added on to it. So had we taken those back, we would have had to turn right around mm-hmm. and give them back you know, to the ministry. And we thought, how gracious of you, Lord, to give us the opportunity to make this decision uh, to give this over to you uh, instead of having made the other decision and then be forced to turn around and, and feel defeated about it. Hmm. 
Randy Alcorn's been describing true worthwhile investment. Now, we originally aired that interview a few years ago, but Nancy, I really think the conversation is resonating powerfully this week. It is with me. And Dana, I never hear Randy Alcorn speak on this subject that it doesn't resonate in a fresh way with me as well. This is a timeless message because it's from God's Word, and it's one of the most important topics that you see woven throughout the Scripture. Mm -hmm. Our giving is a reflection of God's giving, generous heart. We can't outgive God. But I think the subject is particularly timely right now as we're walking through this season that has so many unknowns, and a lot of people are feeling insecure about the future. Well, that's the time when we especially need the reminder that this world is not our home. And that perspective really changes how we view what we have and what we give. Robert and I want to live out the giving heart of God. We want to be constantly investing in eternity. And as a ministry here at Revive Our Hearts, we're continually trying to invest in eternity by showing women what it means to experience the grace of God and to devote their lives wholeheartedly to Jesus. Now, you are an important part of that mission. And we couldn't be doing what we're doing without the prayers and the financial support of listeners like you. We wouldn't be reaching hundreds of thousands of women internationally with the hope of the gospel without your part in making that possible. And I want to let you know how deeply grateful I am for each gift that is given and for the impact that your generosity is having on helping women experience freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ. And you know, this has special meaning today because it's Giving Tuesday. And you may know this is always the Tuesday after Thanksgiving, and it's a day for collectively having a heart to give. And partly we do it to counteract the consumerism that takes place this time of year. This day is just a great opportunity to say yes to investing in God's kingdom purposes. And this day is kicking off a month where we're coming to the end of our calendar year, and we're asking God to provide in a big way to meet our needs here at Revive Our Hearts and to equip us with the funding to launch into 2022. Now, one way we've already seen God's provision is through some generous friends of this ministry who have seen what God is doing, and they want to encourage others to give. And so they've come up with a matching challenge to match each gift that's given to revive our hearts beginning this week and then throughout the month of December. So here on this Giving Tuesday, would you consider supporting God's kingdom work through the ministry of Revive Our Hearts? And Dana, I love the fact that every gift that is given today and throughout the month ahead will be matched dollar for dollar thanks to this matching challenge provided by a generous group of ministry friends. That's when I like to give when I can double the giving. And when you participate in this matching challenge today, Giving Tuesday, we'd like to send you a copy of Randy Alcorn's book, The Treasure Principle. It's just a special way we want to say thank you today for taking part in the challenge. And let me just say again how much I love this little book by Randy Alcorn. The Treasure Principle. It is a treasure. And if you don't already have a copy of that book, I want you to get it and I want you to read it. It will be life changing. And again, we'll send that to you for your donation of any amount today to Revive Our Hearts. You can make that donation by visiting us at reviveourhearts.com or call us at 1 800 569 5959. And again, when you give, be sure to request your copy of The Treasure Principle. Once more, that number is 1-800-569-5959. Now, you might be having some questions after listening to today's conversation with Randy. You might be wondering, what about legitimate needs? When is it okay to spend rather than give? Well, tomorrow, Randy Alcorn will address issues like that. Please be here for Revive Our Hearts. Revive Our Hearts with Nancy DeMoss Walgamuth is helping you find joy as you experience freedom, fullness, and fruitfulness in Christ.